I'm going to pick up a little bit what I was doing last time. Okay, uh, we had sort of like a weird graph going on at the end. Um, and uh, I, th I think, um, well, I'll go over some of the, intu oh, sorry, more of the intuition on that. Okay, um, it, it actually is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's, it's hard to graph properly. Okay, I guess I could have done, gone, gone on a computer and, and actually done it. But, but I figured out a way we can think about it as, as more of like a, a marginal benefit, marginal cost analysis. Okay, so we're gonna do that. And then, and then probably we'll have time um, near, you know, the middle to the end to do a little bit on stochastic processes. Okay, so this is really an extension of kind of value function stuff. Okay, but uh, adding in, in continuous time, but adding in um, uh, the ability to, you know, sort of value stochastic processes. Okay, so yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's um, we, we, we did a little bit of that, right? When we were doing a creative destruction with this creative destruction model, because you can be booted out, right? That's a stochastic event, okay? So we have sort of jump events uh, where you change state, okay? Uh, but we also um, may want to add in continuous processes that are sort of moving around over time. So this stuff, it's it's often used in finance. I think um, Black-Scholes uh, result, I think implicitly kind of uses some of this stuff because you need to think about if you got an option, how is the price going to evolve uh, given that you can, you can strike early if you want, okay? So um, yeah. All right, so that's that's kind of the plan. All right, let's jump over to the iPad here. Okay, so this this was the graph from last time. Um, it, it didn't. Yeah, so so I, I mean the the result is correct. It, it's just sort of like this this result where if you have a high or low lambda, you're going to get an inefficiency, but then in the middle you you, you probably won't. Okay. Um, yeah. So let but let, but I think I think you know it, it's probably better okay to sort of step back okay and just think about. Um, Marginal benefit and marginal cost. So we're still doing Schumpeter. Okay. Still doing Schumpeter. All right. Okay. And, and we're just kind of trying to think about the, the, the equilibrium outcome vis a vis the uh, social planner's outcome. All right. Um, okay. And, and I actually, let's, let me just write down and copy from the notes here what we found in terms of the, uh, the outcomes. Okay, so the final outcome, all right, is basically, you know, for your equilibrium, okay, we ended up with an, what we're calling our star, remember, uh, how should we write this? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, basically our star is, you know, it's one over lambda times uh, you know, lambda minus one minus rho over gamma. Okay, so that's what we found um, for R star. Okay, and then, you know, if you want to convert it to tau, you multiply by gamma. If you want to additionally convert to a growth rate, you multiply by log of lambda. Okay, and I actually, like I do in the notes, I am going to write, instead of log of lambda, I'm just going to write lambda tilde. Okay, it's just for ease of notation. So lambda tilde over lambda. Okay, and then this is... Minus one gamma minus rho. So that's our growth rate expression. Okay, so so those are you know, they're linearly uh, they're, I mean, they're collinear, right? They just differ by a factor of uh, gamma, uh, which is your productivity, and lambda tilde, which is your step your your log step size. Okay, so that's the equilibrium. And you got your social planner with as we discussed their social planner hat. Okay, of your own imagination. Um, R hat. Okay, no R hat. Let me just scroll down here. When we solve the social planner, where'd you go? Where'd you go, social planner? All right, there we go. Um, get R hat. That's a hat there. Um, what should we write this? Uh, well, yeah, you get R hat, which is one. I guess the best way to write it is one minus rho over lambda tilde times gamma. All right, and that means that you get a g hat of lambda tilde gamma minus rho, which is rather simple. Okay, so those are your, you know, those are your outcomes. I guess we'll, we'll deal mostly with the the growth rate, but you know, they're they're essentially the same because they're collinear, right? Um, with they're collinear with respect to actually, I guess. I mean, they're not collinear with respect to to lambda because we're multiplying by lambda to get to one of them. So. Um, 
but the how should I say this? The ratios, you know, r star to r hat is going to be the same as the ratio of g star to g hat. Okay, so if one's higher, the other must be higher, and so on. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So then, um, all right. So so from here, all right. Uh, I, I think one interesting way to to do this is to think about the to think about the efficiency is to do sort of a marginal analysis. Okay. So what we can do is basically um, if you think about the uh, um, the free entry condition. Okay. That's you know kind of we discussed that's that's a, a, a marginal benefit equals marginal cost kind of thing. Okay. And you can think about the social planner in kind of a similar way. That, you know they're, they're you know when they're doing the Hamiltonian. They're kind of thinking about thinking about a marginal benefit, marginal cost calculation. Okay, um, so let me let me do the let me actually do the social planner first. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing on the on the other side. Okay, so what if we said, you know, we, we want to, you know, if, if we we're just okay. So you're a social planner, okay, and you're before we did the Hamiltonian, which is you're choosing R at every every point in time, uh, and you choose a path, but then the path happens to be constant. Okay, and kind of because the path happens to be constant it would be equivalent had we just written down a, a, a present value you know welfare from time zero and maximize over the single variable r okay because the maximizer of that is going to be equal it's going to give you back the same r okay so so we can use that fact though to think about to make thinking about this uh calculation a little bit easier okay because we can just think about you know um Let's see. So the remember the uh, let's see. So so just like some stuff that's useful here. Okay. So we knew we know that you know y is q times p. All right. And then you know like u of the, the u of c then is u of y, which is uh, u of well, it's, uh, I'll write it as log. Okay. So is log of q p. Okay. Um, yeah, and so uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, that, that's that's actually all we need to think about this in, in a very sort of stylized way. Okay, is that is that our objective, our our per period objective, um, is log of QP, and then we have some discount rate rho. Okay, so from that, I mean, we, we have enough to kind of think about what would be going on here. Okay, so we'll, we, if you think of a social planner though, they're equating the social marginal benefit with the social marginal cost and, and they're choosing R. Or R hat or whatever. Okay, so they're choosing R to equate social marginal benefit and social marginal cost, assuming the concave problem is continuous and all that, right? Um, all right, and then so what's social marginal benefit? So. Now we're thinking of the social marginal benefit of switching a uh, uh, research or a person, a worker from from production to research, right? So when you when you switch a worker from production to research, the benefit is well, basically you, you have some probability of actually succeeding at generating an innovation. Okay, and when you succeed at generating an innovation, you will. Uh, Increment a random product's productivity by a factor of lambda, okay, which uh, is going to go into Q, kind of infinitesimally, but it'll be proportional to log of lambda, okay. It, it, you know, it truly the, the effect will be, be zero, but but you'll have sort of an infinitesimal log log lambda effect on that. So actually, I'm writing lambda tilde, so we're going to write lambda tilde here. So the, lambda tilde, which is Recall log of lambda. Okay, so it's the probability that thing happens. The actual effect. Okay, that's basically that's your marginal impact on U of C, and then to turn that into you know, a, a value, we just divide by rho. Okay, because this is the social planner. They all they care about is they just discount the future rate rho. So their valuation, present valuation equation or process is very simple. Okay, so that's it. All right. Um, and then I guess here over here, we can write this as Q of one minus R, right? It's gonna be useful. Okay, so um, for the marginal cost, okay, social marginal cost of, of switching a, a worker from production to research, well, it's the lost production, okay? 
So it's the derivative of that U of C with respect to the R component. Okay, so you're gonna, you know, the log is separable, so you're gonna get one over one minus R, and then you'll, you'll, you get a minus sign, which, which means it's a cost, but we're already accounting for that. So you're just gonna get one over one minus R. Okay, and that's, a, that's the derivative of U of C with respect to, to R, basically. Okay, on the right, on the left, and the left is basically the derivative of U of C through Q, basically, with respect to R, but, but Q for, for the entire future. So, right, so you, you move R, that changes P production in the immediate sense, which is also, you know, it's, it's an inaccessible effect because you're, it's a derivative of, of it, right? Um, and on the left-hand side, you, know, you move R, you, you bump up Q a little bit by this factor lambda tilde with probability gamma, and then you just discount that in the future. So th this, you know, I'm being pretty informal here, um, but this is the logic for that calculation. And in fact, you know, if you solve this, you get the same thing. You get R hat is, well, you, you can see, I mean, look, like if you look up, half, right? I mean, it's one minus one over that thing we have on the left. Okay. So to solve for R, you invert it and do one minus, right? So you're going to get one minus rho over um, gamma. Okay. So you get the same thing. That sort of informal logic that I, that I gave happens to be right. Okay. You, you, sometimes when you do that stuff, you, you, the, the, what, you know, I, I, I made sure to, to go through and check that that actually is the right answer. That that's not a tried and true way to solve a model because, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, but if you change this thing, something else changes and you didn't account for that, right? So I was being a little sloppy there, but but it turns out that's basically the logic that the social planner is following. Because R is constant and things are relatively simple, that actually, you know, I, I didn't miss anything, okay? Um, all right, but then you can also, so that that's, well, that's the, the solution to it, right? But, you know, you can just think about, um, you can think about it graphically, Okay, you know, I think you have R going from zero to one, right? Okay, uh, and then you have your, you know, your, your various marginal benefit, marginal cost um, terms. Okay, not, we're not thinking about the ratio, I guess I should write a comma. Okay, so, so you can plot those. Okay, so plot the left thing, which is just a constant. Let's plot the right thing first. So the right thing um, actually starts at one. Okay, when R is zero, that thing on the right is one, right? And then it's going to asymptote to infinity as R goes to one, your marginal cost. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, let me draw it first and then we can, right? So you got this, um, right? And that's going to, you know, it's going to go, it's not going to touch that line, right? So um, that is your, your marginal cost. And what that means is basically you got log utility. Um, as you go to R equals one, uh, you're going to do, you're going to be converged in zero production. You're going to hit an, an out of condition there on, on the log. Okay. That's what that cost means. Right. Um, and then, uh, so that's marginal cost. All right. And then uh, the marginal benefit. Okay. So you're going to start out. Well, that's, a, that's a straight line. Okay. In, in the case of the social planner, that's just a straight line. Okay. So that's going to look like, let's say, let's say, let's say that's, that's a straight line. You know, I can't take it. Can't take it. Let's say that's a straight line. It's not perfectly straight, but it's close enough. Okay, so then this is going to go, and it's not that interesting. Okay, it's just, it's just a supposedly straight line. Okay, got a baby issue here. Just take care of. Don't worry. Um, all right. So then that is a constant at this value, um, gamma lambda tilde rho. All right, uh, and that's your marginal benefit. Okay, so. The social planner is actually kind of boring. It's just, you know, you got a constant marginal benefit, increasing marginal cost, there's an intersection, right? And that intersection, if you solve it algebraically, is R hat. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it. Okay, so so pretty simple game for the social planner. Okay. The, uh, the, the and now looking on the private side, uh, for the equilibrium, Okay, things get a little bit more complicated. Okay, uh, and, it, and actually we'll see it basically, basically the marginal cost, is gonna look almost the same. Okay, but then the marginal benefit is gonna be different because how much other people are doing in terms of research in the Schumpeterian model, you know, you're gonna get booted out more often. Okay, that's gonna increase your effective discount rate. That's actually gonna affect your marginal benefit. 
right? If there's a lot of research, your marginal benefit's gonna be lower because there's a lot of churn and you're gonna get booted out without a flow probability more quickly, okay? So um, let's do that, all right? So that's, that's the next thing, okay? And then, so what we're saying here Okay, is that instead of your social marginal benefit equaling your social marginal cost, that free entry condition basically is just saying the, the private marginal benefit is equal to the private marginal cost. Uh, here, I guess it's from the perspective of a worker. Okay, um, that's that's the free entry condition. Okay, um, the perspective of a worker that's switching to kind of considering switching to research from production. Okay, so. If they switch to research, okay, um, then you get this with probability gamma, you're successful. And when you're successful, you get that V, the value of uh, taking over a new product line or, or taking over an existing product line and booting out the incumbent, all right? So um, that's your benefit. Private marginal cost is W, so in the uh, in the opportunity cost interpretation, you know, you didn't become a production worker and so you don't get that wage W, right? The other way to think about it is you're, you're, you're a research firm that hires a researcher and so you, you, you with probability gamma V, or with probability gamma you get V, you're successful and you have to pay a cost W, okay? So that that's that's really, you know, from the perspective of a research firm, it's private marginal benefit, private marginal cost. And you, you're gonna, those should be equal on an equilibrium because we want people to be doing one or the other. We, we want people to be mixing between research and, and production, okay? So the, uh, yeah, I mean the, you know, the, the equilibrium really, because of the linearity really is kind of a mixed strategy thing in some sense. I mean, it's it's because you're, you're equating the returns so that people will be willing to do either production or research, and then you set that production research split so as to equate those returns, right? So the logic is similar to that of a mixed strategy equilibrium, Nash equilibrium. Okay, um, we don't, we don't, I, we haven't specified like what's the pool of potential researchers. It's, it's we're, we're essentially treating it as, as big enough. Okay, um, <clears throat> but um, you you can think about it like that. It, it's a, so it, it really just depends on the interpretation. Okay, all right. So then, um, so yeah, from here. Um, I mean, we have, we've already kind of done this, okay? So, but but I think it's instructive to go through it a little bit and get an analogous equation to what we have on the right, okay? Um, let's see, so the way we can do that is, well, the first step is, you know, on the left, that's gonna be gamma pi over rho plus tau. That's what we found before that the way that you value, the, the value basically is pi over rho plus tau. It's the flow value divided by your effective discount rate, which is your pure discount rate rho, plus your uh, uh, the creative destruction rate tau. Okay, and tau is going to be gamma r, and we're going to sub that in a second. So so don't worry about that. That's going to be a function of r. Okay, so we're gonna, we're going to basically I want to get everything to be a function of just r. That's the goal here. Then I can compare it to what we have on the right to basically this comparison here. All right. Um. Okay, so then, uh, yeah, so so we need to do a little bit more work here, but it's not it's not too bad. Okay, so so we know what pi is. We actually we know what w is basically, right? Um, so it's just a matter of plugging this in, those in. So we're gonna get lambda one minus lambda inverse times y. Okay, so remember pi is one minus lambda inverse times y. It's uh, that function of lambda of your of your technological lead that goes from zero to one, depending on your, uh, how much bigger your lead is than one, times the actual output, okay? And then here we get rho, and then we have, uh, I'll plug it in now, I guess, gamma times r. So tau, remember it's gamma times r, because r is the number of researchers, gamma is the probability of success, okay? Um, and then uh, on the right-hand side, okay, um, so, so remember, you know, so that the, the pi equation, right? So let's do a little sidebar here. So remember the pi equation said this, right? That's, that's your profit. Okay. And that's also saying that the profit share is one minus lambda inverse, right? 
the total because total profit there's a unit mass of of product so total profit is also pi and that's saying that pi is some fraction of one minus lambda inverse which is between zero and one of y um the other thing we found before was that the labor sh the production labor share is just the remainder of that so lambda inverse y okay um and it, and that means that w is you know y over l times lambda inverse okay so so you know here at this stage right on the left we have profits to the right we have wages and those two basically are you, I mean, those form kind of a GDP decomposition in the sense that, you know, some fraction of GDP goes to profits and some fraction of GDP goes to, to production labor. Okay. Now that gets shifted because of research labor. Research labor comes out of sort of total net profits and into total production, which is fine, but, but you can split GDP along these lines to just sort of ignoring research labor for a moment. Okay, so it is interesting that you get you get on the left and right hand side of the stage you get these two things that that are um, fully sort of comprised, compose whatever uh, GDP. Okay, um, probably comprise. Let's go with comprise. Um, so on the left we plug in for pi, and then on the right we, we plug in for W, moving that L over. W right. L W P. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, what are we doing? Uh, yeah, no, it's W P. You're right. WP. So yeah, P, if P is for yeah, P, is production labor, R is production labor, and then there's one unit of total labor. Correct. Yep. So WP. All right. So then we get, uh, you know, lambda inverse times, well, I don't know how to write this. I'll write it as a proper fraction. We're going to get uh, lambda inverse Y over P. Okay. So there we go. Um, all right. And then, uh, so yeah, from here, okay, I mean, you, you can see that the, the Ys are gonna cancel, okay? Um, those are just sort of overall scaling factors, so let's cancel those, okay? And then we can, so we can write this as, you know, lamb, uh, gamma times this profit share, you know, R, and then on the right we're left with, well, we have lambda inverse one over P, which is just one minus R. Okay, so this this is in some sense this is pretty close to being comparable to the social planners side because you know, on the right hand side we have well we have one one minus r plus that that lambda inverse term okay and on the left hand side we have something like profit that's it's purport you know it looks proportional to, to lambda in some ways okay so so here we could we could plot this okay and do that um, I think it's a little easier if you kind of because because what's going on on the right is that um, the wage is not equal to the marginal product. So because these firms are monopolists, they're paying workers less than their marginal product and pocketing the rest of the money as profits. Right? That's how it works. Um, so so whereas in the social planner, the, the kind of the, that right hand side thing really is the marginal product by kind of by definition. Okay. So. Um, there's some monopoly distortion on the labor market side happening, okay? Um, and we could leave that and, and, and plot two different things, but if we just kind of move that lambda over and kind of normalize that away, it, it actually makes them much more directly comparable. Okay, so I'm going to do that, all right? So I'm going to, that lambda on the right-hand side, I'm going to move on the left, and this equation is going to then look like lamb, gamma, lambda, and lambda minus one, rho plus gamma r, and then it's going to be equal to exactly that uh, social marginal cost. Okay, so we kind of, we tilted the scales a little bit, okay, to make them more comparable, right? But um, by normalizing a way that, that labor market side monopoly distortion, but now, you know, we can, we can, we can, plot, we can plot this stuff on the right, okay? So, um, so maybe I'll call it, you know, it's, you know, it's sort of like private marginal benefit tilde, private marginal cost. Tilde because we've we've added on that lambda term, okay. I guess we also canceled the y, but that's that's fine, okay. So um, alrighty. So now we can here here these are. I guess I should to label these properly. These properly. Um, you know this is 
social marginal cost, social marginal benefit. That's what we plotted before. Okay, now it turns out that's equal to our sort of like normalized private marginal cost. Okay, and then we also, so now we're, you know, so now, you know, SMB, SMC, private marginal benefit, private marginal cost. Okay, so I don't know why I'm listing these all so exhaustively, but that's, that's what we're plotting here. Okay, so we have the costs, we have the social marginal, sorry, we have the benefits, which, which, um, sorry, I did the wrong thing. This should be the thing that's that's equal. So private marginal cost. So the costs are equal. Okay, sorry about that. And then, the, but the benefits are going to differ between social and private. Okay, so with social marginal benefit, it's just a constant. You, you increment the thing by lambda, and that lasts forever. No biggie, all right. And then uh, the private marginal benefit, you know, because you have this creative destruction factor, it's going to taper off. Okay, and uh, so think about that PMB till they term down here when so when r equals zero that's where it starts out okay and gamma lambda minus one over a row that's where it starts out okay and actually i need this space so sorry labels you're gone all right now um that that gamma lambda minus one over row term that looks almost like gamma lambda tilde over row but not quite the same but remember last time we discussed this relationship between the log of lambda and lambda minus one. They're close. They start out at zero. This function of lambda, they have slope one even. Uh, but then the linear function, obviously, uh, over time exceeds the logarithmic concave lambda tilde function. Okay, so um, so for any pa for any lambda greater than one, this thing is going to be larger. Okay, so it's going to be somewhere up here. Okay. So that's just always true, and, and but that's that's at r equals zero, right? So that that means that when you're at r equals zero, the the those discount rates for the the private the the social are the same, okay? That's that's why we can do this. Um, so you just one over a row. Um, now as r goes up, this thing is going to decay because of creative destruction. Okay. Now from from this point on, I'm gonna I'm gonna write a you know kind of a one over x or one over something plus x looking curve. One, one over one plus r looking curve. Uh, how exactly that plays out will determine whether I intersect above that uh, equilibrium point or below. Okay, you know it. It, it just kind of it seems more natural for it to go below because if it went above, you know, then I'd kind of I I need to get down to zero eventually. So at least according to this graph, if I went above, I'd have to go very, very slowly after that too. Okay, so of course this is just a graph and the, and the, the implicit numbers, well, it's not even right because I just drew it by hand. It's not, not an accurate reflection of these equations, but but the numbers implied by it, uh, who knows if they're right or not. Okay, so that I, I plugged in some numbers and I'll, I'll, we can talk about what it kind of reasonable numbers look like in a second. Okay, but um, kind of seems like it's possible for the intersection to be above. So this intersection here is is now is a R star, the equilibrium. It's possible for it to be above, but it doesn't seem super likely in some sense. Okay. Um, and we kind of saw that with the graph last time, where it's like we, we if we look at the, the limits at zero or at one, lambda equals one and lambda equals infinity, yeah, there was too much investment in equilibrium. Uh, but then kind of getting the whole thing to add up was seemed a little tough. Okay, so so what's going on? Okay, so first of all, the, you know, this this is these you know, this is the outcome. This is how we can think about these things. And you can with this, you know, you can do comparative statics, right? And and those sometimes are a little easier to, to do it graphically. Okay. Um, and you can kind of see, at least for what I would call a reasonable case, why there would still be underinvestment. Okay, because you know this, yeah, you know, the, the Basically, but you know the curve starts higher, but then it, it goes downwards, and you're comparing that to a flat curve, all right? And uh, but it but it looks kind of reasonable that it, it intersects in a lower value for r. Okay. Um, all right. So then uh, I guess the next thing we can do is is think about specific numbers. Okay, just to, to get an idea for you know is what what what's kind of going to happen in in a, a world that 
we think is reasonable. Okay, and, and it's actually a little surprising. Okay, so the, the exercise here that I'm going to do, though, is there's stuff that we kind of have an idea about. Okay, so numbers. Specific numbers. Okay, so there's stuff that we kind of have a, an idea about, like rho, the discount rate, and there's stuff that we really like. What's gamma? I don't know. Maybe that could be anything, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so let's say rho. Let's say rho is five percent. That's actually kind of high. But, um, I mean, usually the, the discount rate you think about as being five percent. Maybe. Well, let's. Maybe we should do rho equals three percent. Let's do rho. Let's let's do. Three percent, right? That means that um, you know if rho is three percent and growth is two percent in a log utility oil equation world, that means the interest rate is five percent, which is not so out of the question. Okay, so so I'm just trying to you know, get some ballpark numbers here. Okay, now lambda. Well, I don't know. I mean, what lambda is quite arbitrary because. I mean, you can always kind of increase lambda. So let's say you have a certain, you know, some you're going to have some lambda gamma combination. You can always increase lambda, the step size, and then decrease gamma, the probability, such that like the expected value or the growth rate is going to look similar. But it's just like how big are you calling an innovation? Who knows? All right. So um, one thing though is that lambda will determine profits. Okay, because remember the profit share is one over one minus one over lambda. The profit share, we we kind of have, we're, we're better at determining. I mean, that's something we can map into the real world, okay? And now, the, you know, there's the question of, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, so there's the question of how do you, what exactly is the analog for profits, right? Because we have, you know, one minus lambda inverse is the production profits, but firms are also at various points in time paying for research. Okay, so we want to we want to account for that. Um, so so basically, but basically, you, you can think about it as like, is it is it pi? I guess it would be pi, you know pi over y. Okay, that would be which is which is going to be equal to one minus lambda inverse. That that's like the pure production profit margin normalized by GDP. Okay. Right. So if, if, uh, if, uh, Lambda is about 10%, this is also going to be about 10%. Okay. Um, yeah, for, for small Lambda, it's approximately linear. Okay. Um, but then we could also think about, uh, let's see, pi over Y minus, you know, basically WR over y, right? We can think about um, prop, which is you know it's pi minus wr, so that's uh, pro production profit minus whatever you pay you're paying, I guess, over time in in research. Okay, so it's a little weird here because the firms that are getting pi have already succeeded at research and never do research again in the model, and then there are other firms that are doing research in hopes of becoming an incumbent. So, but in reality, in the real world, of course, incumbent firms are also doing research. And that's showing up in their balance sheet over time. Okay. It's one of the reasons I think why Amazon can not pay that much in taxes because they they do research, right? And that, that pushes down their, their realized profits after that. And also there's some various you know, subsidies for research so or uh, uh, tax credits. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so if, but if we do that, okay, then you're going to get, uh, you know, you're going to get that base term, 1 minus lambda inverse. And then you're going to get W over Y times R, which I guess is going to be, well, that's going to be, so, so remember, if you go up here, remember W is, <clears throat> you know, is lambda inverse Y over P. So then W over Y times R is lambda inverse times R over P. Okay. Which is R over one minus R. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's a thing. Okay, that's I mean that that's 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 tough because it's it's sort of endogenous. Okay, um, uh, and so to to figure out what lambda 
makes it so that this moment hits, you know, 15% profit margins or whatever is, is, well, it, it, it's actually very easy, but it, it, you know, you'd have to use a computer to, to, to do like an interview. You say, okay, suppose Len does this, solve the, you know, plug, solve the equilibrium. I guess we could do it algebraically too, but, um, you know, plug it in, find what R is, calculate it, and then see, does it match up? Okay. Whereas for this, for the first one, we can say, okay, well, if lambda is 10%, then this profit margin is also about 10%. Okay. I, I think one, one, one good thing we could just do is say, okay, well, let's say that lambda is about 15%. Okay. Um, then this, where are we? this term here would, would be about 15%. Okay. Um, because, you know, it's, it's one, sorry, I guess it's, Lambda minus one really is, is going to be 15%. So lambda minus one, because the lambda is one base, is 15%. This thing's going to be about 15% too. Okay, it's it's one over one minus one over 1.15, which for small lambda, it's it's approximately lambda, basically. Okay, um, I don't know what's the, the actual number is uh, going to be... 13%. Okay, so so that gives you 13%, you know, sort of production profit margin. And then there's going to be some research that comes off of that. And maybe that gives you like 8% profit margin, which I think is not so bad for vis-a-vis for, -vis the data, right? Okay, so so let's say land is about 15%. It's going to be in somewhere in that ballpark, okay? Um, okay, so we got the discount rate. We got the lambda. All right, the last thing we need to know is, is gamma. Okay, and the, the way we can get gamma is is just by looking at overall growth. Okay, because um, uh, you know the uh, yeah, I mean the, the the you know we have the growth rate. Where's, where's the growth rate? In equilibrium up top there, that's our growth rate. Okay, if we know if we say rho is three percent, um, and lambda is uh, 1.15 or, you know, lambda minus one, it's 15%. There's some gamma that's going to give us, us our target growth rate. Let's say our target growth rate is 2%, like in the US, okay, 2% uh, TFP growth over time, or, you know, GDP growth or whatever uh, per capita. All right. So, um, so we can do that. All right. Um, let me, I actually, when I, I did this before, but I, I, I decided upon different numbers sort of endogenously just there. So I need to recalculate this, but it's not so hard. Look, I'm gonna. Okay, so if we if we choose gamma equals two, we're gonna get three point three percent growth. I guess I could show you this, but it's it's just a Python console. Um, so if we choose gamma equals two, we get three point three percent growth. That's too high, so we need to lower gamma. Okay, so you know I I could just write a solver for this in like three seconds, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do it the dumb way. If we go to 1.5, then we get 2.3%. We're almost there. 1.3 gamma gives us 2.00%. Okay, so gamma is 1.3. Fact. All right. Um, 1.3, I guess it, I, I'm not going to write it in percent, but it's 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 1.3. Okay, so, and there we can, we can really see gamma is not a probability, right? It, I, I sometimes say probability, it's, it's a flow probability, right? So uh, so it can, it can be anything positive, including things greater than one. Okay, so this gives us, well, kind of, uh, it gives us a, an interest rate of 5%, okay? A discount rate of 3%, which is, I think, in line with kind of micro experiments, um, uh, a profit margin that's reasonable and a growth rate of about 2%, which is also kind of what we see, okay? so. So we, we, you know, then we can, from these, we can kind of move it forward. It's like, well, we engineered G star already to be 2%, right? Okay. Uh, but that's how we found gamma. Okay. So, so we've engineered G star to be correct, right? In the sense of it predicts what we see in the data. Uh, but then we can, now we can say, okay, well, what, what, what's, what's, the, what's the limit? What, what's G hat, right? If we did things optimally, what would happen? And it turns out if you calculate g hat in this case, it's a uh, you know a log of lambda times gamma, so log of uh, one point one five times gamma, so it's about fifteen percent times gamma, which is going to amp it up even to twenty percent, 
minus rho. So you're going to, you, we'd expect around 17%. And actually, you know, exactly, you get about 15%, which is like, wow, that's big. That's a lot. That's bigger than you. You haven't even seen that in China for possibly ever, not over a sustained period of time, I think, um, in, in their rapid period of growth. So that's big. Um, obviously that, I mean, I don't believe it. Uh, something is, you know, we're extrapolating way outside of the domain of this model, right? So even if you believe the equilibrium model in some sense, when you start saying, okay, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? Th maybe things break down. Okay, so I guess the question is, okay, first of all, I can say, okay, I don't believe 15%. Question is, what what do we think might break down? Why don't we believe that, okay? Um, so there's the research production function that was assumed to be linear, exactly linear. You can ramp up research as, as much as you want and you're gonna get exactly proportionate gains. Possibly not the case, right? There might be a sense that, uh, think about Jones, you know, you, you, if you push things too hard, you, you can't, I mean, actually, you know, we made we made, we made made a damn COVID vaccine in, in like a few months we we actually maybe we can do things that we try, but but maybe we got really lucky with the COVID COVID vaccine. mRNA was just sitting there. We were being kind of skittish about testing it, I think, and then we're like, well, okay, we we really have to do this now, and then we did it, right? So so maybe we got really lucky, but also you know it happened, right? I mean they they actually did it. You know I think there there are various interpretations of this, but you know the 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 news is sort of like you know they basically did it in like two days. They're like they came up with. The, the correct mRNA sequence for the whatever the spike protein in two days and everything else was sort of scaling up, figuring out production and, and testing, of course, making sure it's safe and all that. So, so I don't know, maybe the, the, I'm not sure how the, uh, the experience with the COVID vaccine influences this, but, but you might think in, in, in a general sense, okay, maybe this differs across field. You can't just scale up research and hope and, and say, you, you know, you scale up research by X factor and get X factor output in terms of innovation because people are gonna do duplicative innovation because they're not always communicating with each other about what they're doing in real time. Um, you're gonna, yeah, I mean, you need to, there's an order. You need to th figure things out in an order. You need to figure out the current generation of technology, figure out how it works, how it doesn't work, and then move to the next. If you try and do five steps of technology at the same time, things are gonna go wrong, right? Um, People are going to not coordinate uh, which path of research they're taking, you know. So, so you can think of a lot of reasons why that that research production function breaks down, and you can't just ramp it up as a social planner. Okay, so that that would be my first guess. Um, maybe I don't know. You can think about financial things, perhaps mm, firms having trouble or something going amiss in the financial sector. Okay, because finance is still important here, right? Because you need to. Uh, you're 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 putting down potentially a large um, uh, upfront cost to get your your flow of value in the future. So you you know you need finance to say okay, I, I'm going to borrow some money to do this research, and with I'm going to be successful with some probability, and, and you should give me that money. Okay, that's kind of a hard sell. Oftentimes it turns out um, in this world there's perfect information, and there is a random outcome, but it's 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 uh, known sort of the probabilities are known objectively. Uh, so finance isn't hard in this world, but in general, finance is difficult. Okay, so I don't know. The social planner doesn't have to care about finance, but if you were thinking about then implementing a social planner's policy, the tools you you would probably need finance at some stage. Okay, so that's another place where things kind of break down. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, but it is what it is. This is what the model says. All right. Uh, we, we don't have to believe it though. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, and then I guess, so, so here you can see big under investment in equilibrium, according to the model, May, maybe not, uh, at least it's indicative of, 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 it's plausible to think that there's another investment. Maybe it's not as big as the model says, but it's possible to think that there's another investment. Okay. Um, the other thing you can do, in addition to saying, okay, well, here, here's what we need to get an, uh, a realistic looking equilibrium, and then what does the social planner look like? The other thing you can do is say, okay, well, let's let's look at um, other parameter values. Can we find parameter values where this flips, where there's actually overinvestment in equilibrium? Pretty tough. Um, 
I tried a bunch, and I think I got one at some point. You need to make Landa really big, okay? You need to make Landa really big. Um, and uh, the problem with that is that it starts not looking like the data at all, right? Because if you make Landa really big, then profits are really big. Okay, and and maybe you say, okay, well, we're not going to look at production profits. We're going to look at production net of research um, here. Okay, so you make Lambda really big, so that that production profit term it gets really big, and actually this this should be a minus sign here, not a plus sign. Okay, so we're subtracting off research costs, um, and but but then you can kind of make up for it by saying, okay, well then there's a lot of research, but but then if Lambda is big, then this this term is getting downscaled. Okay, so so it, it's it, it, if you push land up a lot, your your start your profits start looking goofy large. Okay, um, but but you can do it, and and you can eventually get it to the point where where you actually have an overinvestment. Okay, but it's like you need to go up to like land equals five, like not five percent, but like five hundred percent. Okay, so that's pretty big. You know, it means you're, you're with an innovation, you're making production you know five times better. 600 percent better or 500 percent better whatever you know um so by and large it seems like the sort of the reasonable empirical and quantitative outcome here is that there is an underinvestment of some sort okay and the the magnitude is predicted to be rather large by the model but the, the model is also fairly simplistic okay all right so um i guess that, that's it for for Schumpeter, i think um the you know the the where where people go after this um, for endogenous growth in general you know they 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 add in stuff they try and make it look more like the data they try and microfound it more and make it look more realistic okay so people you know maybe you add in patent policy maybe you add in different types of innovation that are radical or incremental maybe you add in financing right uh, where you have uh, 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 private information, right? Or something like that, that, that makes financing difficult. Um, uh, or maybe you add in scale effects like with Jones, right? So there, there's a bunch of different dimension directions you could go from here. Um, or maybe you add in a, 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 a more or less like firm side where you say, okay, now incumbent firms can do innovation in addition to what these books here are basically entrants. Um, uh, we can do with that. Maybe you look at what are the predictions for the, the the science distribution of firms? Like, do you can, you can you predict you know how big firms are on average and how uh, you know what's the share of, of output uh, comprised by uh, extremely large firms? You know, like Walmart or Amazon or, or things like that. So so you can you can do all that stuff and start matching the data better by edit, by making your models a little bit more complicated. Um, and that, that's the sort of the route that. Uh, sort of the, the macro side and digestion growth, growth has taken uh, over the years, okay? Um, yeah, at some point, they actually wrote down every model you could ever imagine, and then said, okay, well, we did that. Um, but you can also then bring in different types of data. You know, you can bring in, you, they, they like patent data a lot. You can bring in uh, text data. You can bring in all sorts of stuff. Um, and once you've got more data, then you need more kind of some sense you need more models to, to to think about matching that right or different models at least okay so um yeah so that's that's kind of the course of the the field um okay so uh yeah all right so um i guess I, i'm gonna move on to the to the stochastic stuff now okay um this so but but in terms of you know in terms of what's covered officially by the course like that's it we're done right uh you know, you, you you want to know Schumpeter? You want to understand Schumpeter? Okay, and that's that's sort of where we're, we're calling the lid, right? Um, yeah. So, but the stochastic stuff I'll do, but don't 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 sweat it too much. All right. Um, it it pro may very well be useful, but it's it's not going to come out on the exams. All right. Okay. So, uh, let's see. I guess I'll start. Let me let me start out on the slides here. Okay, and I'll probably jump over to the. Um, uh, back to the uh, iPad in a bit. Okay, so this is uh, five stochastic processes um, building off of some of that value function stuff. Okay, but um, sorry, I'm being called. Almost certainly it's been a call because, oh no, it's my roommate, my own college roommate. Sorry. 
Um, you guys want to talk to my old college roommate? We have a conference call. He's a consultant. He he works for he does consulting for I don't know, he's like for Bain or something like that. So um that's we don't need to think about the real world here. This is economics. Um okay, so uh stochastic processes. Let's do it. Um so so this is this is gonna be fairly general. Okay, I'm gonna give you like a really hyper brief overview of, of stochastic processes in general, and then we're gonna try and apply it to value functions, and that's gonna be it basically. Okay. But um <clears throat> But, but the way that we can think the way that we're gonna think about stochastic processes in continuous time is is the way that we've been thinking about continuous time a lot which is we're, we're, we're kind of starting in this discrete time setting and, and 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 taking the limit as time becomes continuous with little delta size time steps okay so that's the that's the approach that we're gonna take um and uh yeah so yeah and that's gonna that changes some stuff but but we'll see can you can you guys see the math stuff at least on this is that mostly legible okay i'll i'll, I'll talk through most of it so i I'll, I'll i'll tell you what's what's important i don't can i i can the thing is that like when i try to make this bigger it auto rescales such that nothing changes so i don't I'm not sure what deal is. but um okay so so but let me let me walk through it so so basically the most important thing in this this lecture is uh is the the Wiener process okay? So that's na that's named after Norbert Wiener. I think it's Wiener. Yeah, it's Norbert Wiener. Um, some fellow uh, who I don't know. He did a lot of different stuff. Uh, he there. If you've heard the term cybernetics, he was sort of like the big proponent of that. And and cybernetics really never properly became a thing. Uh, it, I think it was just people were like really excited about like kind of computers and, and like doing math and like organizing society in efficient ways. And they, they just got really, really excited about it. And that's like, that's what I think of as cybernetics. Like, you know, we, we got stuff, we got, we got autopilot on, on planes. We may someday get autopilot on, on cars. Um, you know, so we got, we got certain things here, but, but in, I think, you know, obviously we still have to do stuff on our own. We didn't, we didn't go singularity. So, so that, that was, um, well, that was that movement. Um, but what Wiener is actually very influential in general. I think he was, I think he, he was at MIT in like the sixties or something. It's just, he, he, he seemed to be very influential in a, a lot of different fields. But, but one thing he did was, was thinking about stochastic processes. Okay. Um, and, and so this is also called Brownian motion um, on the physics side, for some reason, I think Einstein did, did stuff with this too. Uh, but it's basically, it's, it's, it's a notion of a stochastic process and it's um the reason it's important is that it, it sort of arises uh uh in in a very general setting okay so 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 you know the central limit theorem from like I guess metrics right uh was probably where you guys saw it you know says that if, if so you if you if you have a bunch of random variables and you kind of average them together under certain you know quote unquote regularity conditions it's like basically as long as their tails are well behaved they're gonna start looking normaler and normaler. Okay, and what that means is that the, the normal distribution is sort of a basin of attraction in the space of probability distributions. And so if you take random variables and you start convolving them together, which is to say averaging them, then the thing starts looking normal. Okay, the, the average starts looking normal. Okay, and that th that same thing is true. So if you think about, and I'll go I'll over this a little bit more concrete, concretely in a second. Um, Think about that process of 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 going to continuous the continuous limit, right? So take a take an interval, and 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 say, okay, well, over the interval, we're just going to draw a random variable, and that's going to be our change. Okay, that's step one. Now split the interval in half, draw two random variables, and say that we go from here random, and then here to random. Okay, and keep splitting those in half. You know, then you have four, then you have eight, and each each time step draw a random variable and sort of cumulatively sum those. Okay, and then, and then if you keep going, you're eventually going to get some continuous stochastic process. Okay, and the question is, what does that look like? Okay, and essentially, because if at each little time step, as you take that limit, you're drawing a random variable, and then you're summing them or averaging them, the 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 total path is going to start looking normal. Right, the 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 the, the accumulation of all those little steps is going to start looking normal. Okay, so so basically, because of the central limit theorem. If you take 
uh, if you do sort of a random walk and sort of like do it finer and finer over time, the, the, the result is going to look normal as well. Okay. And that normal result is, is basically the meter process. Okay. And, and what characterizes it and you can do it. It's like, you can, um, say, okay, if I did that, then I get a meter process and it has these properties, or you can say like, what has these properties? And it turns out only the Wiener process does. So it's like in utility theory, these characterization theorems. Okay. But, but if, you know, if I like to think about it, I'm, I'm, I'm a simple person. Just like, let's take this limit and see what happens. Okay. And we get the Wiener process. Okay. And it turns out that it has this property that, um, of in independent increments. Okay. Basically because you're drawing all these little steps independently, the, these increments are going to be independent. So if going from some time T to some time S is here, what I have in the slides. Uh, that difference is going to be normally distributed and with mean zero, okay, because the sort of the baseline is a mean zero process with no drift. Uh, and uh, the variance is going to be, sorry, the variance is going to be proportional to the amount of time that it's elapsed. So that's it. You, you move the process forward. You don't know what's going to happen. Some random thing's going to happen. But the variance of that outcome over that amount of time that you've moved forward is exactly linear in the amount of time that you've moved, Okay. Now it's not clear that you could say, well, I want the variance to be the square root of the, the amount of time elapsed. Why not? Why can't it be that? Well, it turns out if you do that, well, then that's, if you want that to be true over any time step, it kind of doesn't add up. Okay. Because then if you move halfway, then it's the square root. And if you move another half, then it's also the square root, but then that doesn't add up to the total. And so if you want to have it for any increment, you need to do it linearly. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing is, is continuity. Okay. Essentially it's like, um, you don't have big jumps. Okay. With, 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 with probability one, you don't have, you're like going along and then boom, you just jump over here at, this is in the limit. Remember? So for any discretization, of course, you're jumping around by little tiny amounts potentially. Right. But, um, as you, when you, in the limit, it actually is it's continuous in the sense that of like an epsilon delta sense. Okay, if you look at a really small interval, there's not going to be a jump going on there. Okay, but actually, I have pictures. So let's just look at pictures. Okay. Uh, yeah, I made these pictures before I made the, the switch to dark mode. So I did I didn't invert the colors and I didn't have time to do that. But um, yeah, so so these are just two sample paths, okay, of different processes, actually. Okay, so 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 and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So the left hand side, okay. Is this is this Wiener process? Okay, and so so what we do, and this is this is like a. I mean, it, it's a discretization of the Wiener process. So this is somewhere far along that limit, but of course it's a computer. It's 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 not at the limit. Okay, um, and so so what you do though is you, uh, let's see, um, you take uh, you draw a bunch of random normals standard normals mean zero variance one. Okay. You scale down, um, you scale them down by a factor, the square root of Delta. Okay. Um, and then you just add them all up. You cumulatively sum them all. Okay. And this is, this is what you get. Okay. So you get this, it's a, uh, this sort of rich looking fuzzy looking process. Right. And then the kind of reason it looks fuzzy is because it's sort of, in the limit, it's it's a sort of fractal in the sense that if you zoom in on one of those peaks, you're going to see the same thing kind of on average, right? Okay, you're going to see more variation going on. And if you zoom in again, you're still going to see variation as long as you keep upping the resolution, right? Um, so it's kind of, you know, the metabot set and all that stuff. You zoom in, you keep seeing the same thing, uh, sort of the same type of thing, not the exact same thing, but the same type of thing. Okay, so that's why it looks fuzzy. Um, I think you can talk about a fractal dimension of the Brownian motion and so on uh, of the meter process. Uh, so, so that's what we're dealing with. Okay. Um, uh, and it, if you look at stock prices, they look a lot like this, right? But of course stock prices, even they are um, tickered down to some small fraction of a second at this point, but, but you know, they, they look a lot like this over, over reasonable time scales. Okay. Um, the other thing here is, okay, well, there's also the possibility that the central limit theorem doesn't apply. Okay. I almost said it breaks down, but people get mad when I say it breaks down because it doesn't break down. It just doesn't apply. So, so maybe the assumptions of the, the central limit theorem 
don't apply because the the say the distribution is stick tails. Okay, so if you take a Cauchy, so the general notion here is is actually if you generalize this 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 idea of take random variables, kind of scale them down a little bit by the square root of delta, and then cumulatively sum them. Uh, that 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 general idea is called the Levy flight. Okay, um, and that the input distribution kind of determines the outcome. So if you if you input a reasonable distribution, like a normal distribution or any distribution with uh, uh, thin tails, like an exponential, you're going to get the thing on the left because of the central limit theorem. If you input a distribution that does not um, uh, uh, satisfy the conditions of the central limit theorem, you may not get a Wiener process. You probably won't. Uh, if it has thick tails, you're going to get something else. And here you can see it's not continuous. It has these gigantic jumps. No matter how far you go down, you're going to get these jumps because it has thick tails. Okay. So um, it looks kind of cool, uh, you know, but but it, it's not continuous. So it, it, it's not unreasonable, I think. Um, there's nothing saying that it's, it's unreasonable. It's just different. Okay. Um, doesn't have the fuzziness. Okay. It's still fractal. Um, but it doesn't have fuzziness and it has, it has clear discontinuities. Okay, so that's that's sort of when you don't converge to the inner process. You still get something, it's just something else. Um, it also may not have well-defined moments, which can be somewhat problematic. You know? So uh, Why root delta? Is that in the interest of a variance of delta? Yeah, so um, let me think. I mean, if it takes you a pause, then I probably won't be. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there's a good reason. I, I need. I think. I think it's okay. So, no, I, I, because I was when I was saying it, I was like, I should know why it's root delta, but I forgot. Um, and I don't think it's a complicated thing. It's uh, so okay. If if you scale down by root delta, then, um, you're. Okay, so so actually, let me, let me think about this for one second. If if I don't come up with an answer, then we could just pretend this never happened. Um, but but here here okay, so on this on this one, I'm saying you you take the for for the central for the central limit theorem. Uh, you downscale by root n. So if we had, let's say we, we had a, a unit time step and we were breaking it into n size delta things. So so in that case, um, you would have that one is equal to n times delta, okay? Um, so with that, yeah, okay, now, I can't remember why it's root delta. Let me, let me, uh, I can't remember why it's root delta, but it, it is the case. Okay, so let's let's see. If, if you didn't, so it might have to, something to do with root n convergence. Is that yeah? It, it's something to do with root n convergence. So 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 let's say let's say you did this, but you didn't scale down by root delta. So you just took a cumulative sum of normals. So so that would diverge. Okay, and I think it would have. Um, And I think the problem would be that the variance uh, going, so here we're going from zero to one, let's say I had a thousand uh, little draws on, on the left side. Um, it, you, it'd still be a random walk, whatever you, however you scale it, it's a random walk. The question is sort of how, by, by, by um, multiplying by the square root of delta, sorry, that's why you multiply by the square root of delta. So by multiplying by the square root of delta, you make it, uh, so that the um, the variance actually scales linearly. Okay, so 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 you, you take a standard normal. Okay, and then uh, multiply it by square root of delta, meaning its 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 variance is delta, right? So when you multiply something by square root of something, it's it's variant. You, you scale up the variance linearly. Um, uh, so then the variance over that time step would be delta. And then when you add those up, the variance is whatever the amount of the number of deltas that it has passed, right? So when you add up variables, you add up their variances. Um, that's true in general, right? Yeah, it's especially true for normals, but I think it's true in general. So then by multiplying exactly by root delta, 
you make it so that it satisfies that first condition of the Wiener process, which is that um, the, the variance scales up with the amount of time elapsed, basically. And, um, and, and but then if you think about it sort of a little bit more practically, sorry, you're, you're you, you have to downscale these numbers because if you didn't downscale them, as you increase the resolution of sort of the simulation, your variance at the end is going to get higher and higher because you're doing, if you do a random walk with 10 steps, you know, you're going to end up somewhere reasonable. If you do a random walk with a million steps, like you're going to be off the charts, right? So, so, so you scale it down as you get more N and Delta gets smaller, you scale down those numbers so that, so that really, as you increase the resolution of the simulation, it's going to look, it's not going to like jump around. It's not going to diverge. It's just going to get more and more detailed in, 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 the, in, as we see here. Okay. So yeah, it's, 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 it's to satisfy that first condition of the, the Wiener process. Okay. You could not do that. You just wouldn't get a Wiener process at the end. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the logic. Um, and you still do that for the left hand, the, the right hand side one. It just, it doesn't, um, it doesn't converge to a continuous process basically. So, um, yeah. Okay. So then, um, and that, that's actually going to be important when we do the value function stuff. If we have time, we don't have time, we're out of time. Okay. So I'm just going to show you the value function stuff. It, it, it's actually not so bad. Okay. So central limit theorem, this is actually just to prove the central limit theorem. If you're interested in that, check it out, but we can just take it as given. Um, it, it's with characteristic functions. Okay. But, but in general, okay. So we have this notion of a, uh, a Wiener process. The Wiener process, sort of, it, it's like the normal, the standard normal, mean zero variance one. Okay, that's truly the Wiener process. If you want to like implement it, you need to, you, you probably want to give it a proper variance. Okay, so what you do is you you take this, the differential calculus stuff is a little is a little wonky, but this is basically a Wiener process step at at a given time in a di in differential form. And what you do is you just multiply it by sort of like what do you want the variance of this 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 uh more this richer process to be okay so you scale up the variance and then you also add in a drift okay so what this is doing is basically you take your standard normal Wiener process you multiply it by the variance and then you add in some mean okay so so this x here is like the 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 Wiener process but with a mean and variance and here mean is like a drift okay so if you have the mean of that increment that's going to look like a drift and then the variance is just how big are these these uh, not oscillations, but these these uh, fluctuations, okay? So, but but the Wiener process is like the standard normal, and then you, you if you want to use it, you kind of scale it up by multiplying and by adding, okay? Um, you can add in jumps, you can uh, pass on jumps like we saw uh, with the creative destruction and so on, okay? And then the question is, how do you how do you can you put that in the value function, okay? And it turns out you can. Okay, so this thing called Ito's lemma, uh, where it just sort of like shows how to do it. I don't know why it's called Ito's. I mean, it's from a, some person named Ito, obviously, but um, yeah. So it sort of shows what is your value function equation. Okay, and here, here's where that skirt thing comes in. So what you do is, okay, if you want to think about, take the same approach. You say, okay, we want to. Um, uh, uh, you know, value today is equal to flow value plus random stuff evaluated, you know, discounted value tomorrow. Okay, so we're doing this discretized thing. Okay, so so here actually I'm just I'm just calculating the derivative of of a function. Okay, which is kind of all that we need to to get a value. Okay, but but so essentially, if you think about what happens when you discretize in the Wiener process world, okay, you have if you want to think about x of t at some time step t after some time step delta, we start at x of t, right? You drift, you're going to drift. Okay, mu is your drift. Okay, that's sort of the direction that you're moving deterministically. Okay, so that's just delta mu. Okay, so you, your, your rate is mu. You drift by delta mu. Mu can be positive, negative, whatever. The random component, basically, kind of what I was saying before is, you know, with that draw, you draw a random normal which is Z, you scale it up by your actual variance. So, so this is now a, a you know, normal zero sigma, okay? And then you also scale it up by delta to make it that sort of like the thing that approximates a Wiener process, basically. Okay, so that's, the square root of delta is, having that exactly is important because that's the Wiener process, right? That That's the thing that has 
you know, the, 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 that first variance property that, that defines it. Right. So, so that's important. <clears throat> so you take this, you plug it into a Taylor expansion. Okay. And actually what you see is that if you only do the, okay, so we're, we're, I know we're out of time here, but basically the, 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 the moral of the story is if you do this Taylor expansion to kind of define the derivative and you only do the first order, it doesn't work basically uh, because you have a square root of Delta here. And when you divide, you get a one over the square root of delta. And if you take the limit, that blows up. Okay. Um, but at the same time, this Z is a standard normal. So it has expectation zero. So when you take its expectation, that's also zero. So, so basically when you, uh, actually say this, when you just do the first order, you will get an answer, but it won't be correct. Okay. Because if you go to the second order, you have that square root of delta, which gets squared because of the differential. And, it, and you actually, there's another term out there basically lurking that you ignore at your own peril, which will give you a, a, a second derivative. Okay. And, but, but the, the, the intuition is this, you're on a value function, right? You're moving around. And so you might want to know the derivative because you can say, I'm here today. I'm drifting around deterministically, like say I'm doing capital investment. I want to know the derivative so that I know what my values, how it's going to change with a deterministic drift. Now, if you add on top of that, there's a random noise going on. Well, then at that point, the, the, the concavity of the function is also important, kind of like a Jensen's inequality style thing. If you're exposed to noise, you also want to know the concavity of your value function to, to, to know how to value that noise in expectation. Okay, so that's, and so what you end up with is this term here. So the second derivative of the value function times the variance. Okay. So if there's variance, sigma is positive, you care about the concavity because you're, so, you're kind of integrating over that. Okay. And so that's important for you guys. So, so that's Ito's lemma. That, that's sort of, a, you can incorporate, you know, a continuous time sort of Wiener process stuff into the value function. Okay. And I mean, I, I go through the, the proof here. I mean, I'm obviously out of time, but you know, you can, if you want to check it out, you know, uh, I think it's it's pretty interesting. It's pretty useful if you if you do continuous time stuff uh, that's stochastic.